Our next source is Plutarch. He was a Greek biographer. Um, he wrote a lot of you know these lives of these early emperors, um, it also like biographies about other famous Romans and Greeks. Uh, and one of these famous Romans that he wrote about was Cato the Elder, who was um, born in 234. So you know he's writing about somebody who's hundreds of years, you know, past his uh, time. So what what sources does he use? This is the first thing that we need to look at when we're using an ancient source that isn't a contemporary source. Plutarch had access to some things we don't have access to. You know, he had access to writings uh, that were contemporaries of Cato. He also has Cato's own work. He um, did all, he did a lot of different various like treatises on on various subjects. One of his most famous one is is on agriculture. So he's able to quote uh, Cato himself, which is obviously is one of the good things about uh, using Plutarch as a, as a source for Cato, because we actually have some of the some writing some quotes from Cato. All sources are biased, of course, and Plutarch has his own bias. This is obviously an idealized portrait of Cato. In the eyes of Romans, he's the ideal Roman of the old republic. This was written during the, the, the first century of the empire, and people still kind of looked fondly back on the, on the era of the republic and wondering what went wrong. And, and you know, Cato's held up as one of these beacons of old republican Rome. However, while Plutarch talks of his virtue, he does criticize Cato some. You know, he's, he's not totally just, you know, draping himself in the flag and talking about the greatness of Cato and how great of a Roman he was. So he, there is somewhat of a balanced portrait. All right, Cato the Elder is, you know, he was what's called a uh, Noah's homo. He was a new man, which basically meant that he didn't come from a senatorial family, but he was able to rise through the ranks, and um, he, he eventually became a consul and a censor. And the way he does that is through his military career, and he was, he was widely considered a master orator and a litigator. He, uh, you know, he, was, he was a soldier during the Second Punic War, which you know, had a big impact on, on, on the Roman state. Um, Cato was about 16 years old at this time. Hannibal, this is the war where Hannibal is just rampaging through the countryside of Italy, destroying small farms. Um, you know, just wreaking havoc everywhere. Uh, so, like I said, this destruction wrought by Hannibal in the Second Punic War had a real lasting impact on Cato himself. He saw, you know, the suffering and devastation that occurred due to this attack by Hannibal. And so, at, forever after, you know, he really hated Carthage. You know, he would end every speech on the Senate floor with Carthago Delinda S, that Carthage must be destroyed. Um, you know, it could have been a speech about grain shipments from Egypt or something, and then he'd be like, and to conclude, Carthage must be destroyed. Um, he, was, he was very serious about this, and in the end, he actually did get Carthage destroyed by the, with the, uh, the advent of the Third Punic War. But, so just to continue on with Cato's resume, you know, he was a good informal lawyer. Like he, didn't, um, he didn't accept a fee for his services. He would just um, advocate for his friends and family, um, and he was, he was great at this. He, he would win a lot of cases, and this brought him a lot of notoriety. And so he was able to get into politics um, like this after the military, despite having no connections whatsoever. You know, um, one thing that we can look at Cato's experience is that it, it, it is a great example of the social mobility of Rome, that this wasn't such a stratified society where somebody, where only the patricians, only the, the elites were able to, to make it in that world. Um, you could, it, it was possible, although rare, for somebody of low birth, so to speak, to, to make their way to the top and become and reach the highest levels of Roman society. Uh, so this, is, um, I would say Plutarch is a good source for um, the social mobility of the Roman uh, society at this period. Like Cato, Livy, um, he was very suspicious of Greek culture. You know, he was a very patriotic Roman. And there's a story recounted here where there's some Greek ambassadors who come to Rome. Um, they, they had studied at Plato's Academy and while they were in Rome, they uh, were giving a, a philosophy lesson, and these other younger Romans were enjoying it. And Cato was a censor at this time, and he kind of went down there, and he had the magistrate censor who were responsible for, you know, accepting, you know, the Greeks' request. Um, he, he was worried that this was going to soften the Roman youth, you know, that the young of Rome would come to value reputation built on words over one built on deeds. Like he did, he built, he, he was more proud of his reputation as a military man, really, than, than his um, reputation as, as, as an attorney, basically. 
Um, but in the end, obviously, he was unable to stop there, the influx of Greek, you know, Greek culture, especially after um, the Macedonian Wars, and, and, the, and these areas became provinces of the Roman Empire. That you know, the Greek philosophy, science, writing, all this stuff was very influential in Rome. And uh, we even see, you know, Roman emperors um, picking up the, uh, you know, the the fashion of Greek philosophers of wearing a beard. You know, before this, before about before Hadrian, most emperors would not have a beard; they would keep their face shaved. But you know, Hadrian, who you know was considered the little Greek, essentially was his nickname. He he wore a beard like a, a Greek philosopher. And you also see Nero here with the uh, very stylish neck beard. Um, this is where we get down to the irony of Cato's hatred of you know, Carthage and Greece. He was always scared of this foreign influence. But uh, some historians might say that it was people like Cato that actually precipitated the fall of the Roman Republic. And this is how they did it, is that you know, during the Second Punic War, like I said, Hannibal was ravaging the countryside. He's destroying all of these small farms that are owned by Roman citizens. These, a lot of these small farms were owned by Rome's soldiers. You know, at this, at this period, uh, during the Punic Wars, to serve in the military, you had to own land. And they, uh, the Romans had a very good reason for this, is that they didn't want to have mercenary armies. They, didn't, uh, they weren't looking to have a professional army in the way that where their, their allegiance was to whoever was writing their next paycheck. They wanted people that owned property on the Roman Peninsula and had a stake in protecting Rome. And so um, these small farmers were the men that were the, the soldiers for the military. But when Hannibal goes and destroys all these farms, um, these men come back from much longer campaigns than they're used to, and they don't have, their farms are ravaged, they can't afford um, to pay the rents anymore, they've lost a lot of their, their farm tools, and a lot of like, you know, the people maybe they had left to work the farm were killed. And so they have to end up selling these farms for pennies on the dollar, basically. And the people that bought up these farms are people like Cato, that um, these rich landowners that would buy these farms from these small landowners for pennies on the dollar, basically. And they would absorb them into these huge farms that went on to be called uh, latifundia. They're like these big plantations. And not only did they take the land from these Roman soldiers, but they didn't even employ the Roman soldiers to, to work the land. They often, you know, part of the conquest of the Mediterranean, of, of defeating all these enemies, is there was a huge influx of slaves at this time coming from all parts of the Mediterranean, and they used these slaves to operate these latifundia. So now you've got these Roman soldiers who don't have jobs, um, they don't have land anymore, so they can't uh, serve in the military, so they all become, you know, they move to the city of Rome, you know, to, to get on the, the grain dole, basically, and uh, they can't serve in the military anymore. And um, this starts that urban proletariat, which some um, political leaders kind of utilize to, you know, to, to rise to power, and this kind of causes a uh, power struggle that, that um, precipitates the, the end of the Republic. So, we have, so here's, a, uh, here's an example of what happens. So, you know, now the Roman military doesn't have all these soldiers because there's not enough people that own land uh, to serve. So Marius in 107 BC, he famously lifts that, that restriction requiring that you own property to serve. So now these landless poor, all you know, these a lot of this urban proletariat rushes to join the ranks, and uh, they they're going to get paid as soldiers now. And so here, and this is the big nightmare that that they even had this requirement in the first place. Now these men are their allegiance is to their general as opposed to the state of Rome. They have no stake in Rome. They don't have land there. Their general is the one who, after after defeating the enemy, he divvies out the booty that they get from from their conquests and that's where their money is and that's who their their that's who their allegiance is to. So what what this causes is we see that Caesar and his army which is loyal to him more so than than the, than the city of Rome he marches on Rome in 49 BC. Um, so it hadn't really happened previously in Roman history where these Roman armies were were entering the city armed in this way and it may have been the creation of this landless uh, urban proletariat that kind of precipitated the fall of the Roman state in this way. That's something to keep in mind that we, that many historians point to as the fall of the Republic that we get from Plutarch here.